This video was one of the most challenging that I've done. Being off the beaten track and lesser known, I never take visitors there. I pass Montpinson, Villa Bocage and Vier often, but the bits in between were unknown territory and the operation was complicated. There's a link to this web page in the description. It's an amazing map showing all the units involved. But let's get on. The objective of Blue Coat was to take the crossroad town of Via and Montpinson, which could be used by the Germans as a pivot for the resistance. The mission was to be carried out by the 30 Corps and the 8th Corps, spearheaded by the 43rd Wessex Division, whose objective was Montpinson. As often happened, the timing and objective of the operation changed during planning. The original idea was for it to start at the same time as Cobra. That didn't happen. Then it was to exploit Cobra and support the eastern flank of the advancing American troops and capture Montpinson. The start line was to include Comont Levante, which was occupied by the American 5th Division. They now moved west to make way for the 15th Scottish to move in. Due to the rapid advance of the American troops after Cobra, the date was advanced from the 2nd of August to the 30th of July. The assault was to be preceded by a thousand bombers dropping 2,000 tons of bombs. The 15th Scottish moved into Comor while the Americans were starting to leave. The jocks and the Americans inspected each other's weapons. The Americans left a lot of surplus supplies when they left. The Germans had just replaced the 2nd Panzer Division in the area with the 326th Infantry Division. From Comont, we have a good view south. Hill 309 can be seen six miles away. The Germans also had a good view of the slopes just south of the village. The 15 Scottish were to be reunited with the Guards Tank Brigade with three Churchill battalions. The 11th Armoured were also to take part on the right flank. On the left of the Scots was the 30 Corps, made up of the 43rd Wessex Division and the 50th Northumberland Division. They had the 7th Armoured in reserve. The Wessex was to be the main assault, starting from Brixard, going through Carhang to the Bois du Hum. The 15 Scottish would advance from Comont down the good road leading southwest to hold the western slopes of Bois du Hum. The 11th Armoured would advance on the western flank to Le Petit Orne, which was a small hamlet on a crossroads six kilometres west of Saint Martin de Bezas. It was to be a pre attack bombing raid, then later bombing raids to coincide with the start of each phase. The assault was led at 6.45 by the 9th Cameronians heading for Set Vent for the Seven Winds and the 2nd Gordon Highlanders clearing Luten Wood. Both were supported by the 4th Tank Grenadier Guards. They had crab mine clearing tanks and Churchill Crocodile flamethrowers. Each unit was led by about 150 men in line abreast covering 500 yards. The tanks had to use lanes or find suitable openings in hedgerows. Fighter bombers had been attacking enemy positions since 6.15. Then 700 Lancasters and Halifax bombers swept across to pound the landscape before them. In this sunken lane leading to Sedvon, five tanks were lost to mines. Crabs came forward moving at three miles an hour. Mines would damage the flails. One tank destroyed eight mines and the ninth blew the track off. A German machine gun team surrendered. They were expecting to pick off infantry. As they approached Set Vaughan at 8.30, only one Churchill was still in action. Two squadron came up from Comor to pour fire into the village. It took till 1500 hours before the village was cleared. The Gordon Highlanders were following parallel to the Carhang Road. They had to cross minefields covered by machine guns to clear out the orchards and the woods at Luten and Mondon. J. 
Churchill crocodiles were useful as they approached the woods. The flame was supposed to reach up to 100 yards, but in practice, due to wind or the lie of the land, it was much less. They needed close support to protect them from Panzerfausts. Not just the sight of a fire belching dragon would often cause the Germans to surrender. It was in this action that Lieutenant Cornwall was killed and made a video on his isolated grave at the corner of the now disappeared wood. A man with a blue raincoat and helmet turned up. He was a photographer. He told a Gordon to point his rifle that way and look as if he was doing something. That's how you get an action shot. They were behind schedule. At 15.55 the bombing raid was to start on phase 3 objective and that was miles away. The Argyles were supposed to go into action in phase 2 but the Gordons hadn't got that far yet. To try and catch up to schedule, the Argyles passed through the Gordons to find that their start line was the German main line of defence. To complicate matters, the radios didn't always work and their operators, with a big pack on their back and long aerial, were prime targets. Once through this line, the accompanying Scots guards carried on faster, carrying some infantry. They were lucky that the Germans had few heavy anti-tank guns. The Germans thought that Bockard would stop tanks. The Churchills were very effective at crossing unfavourable terrain. At her view, they could see their objective, Hill 309, and that it was being pounded by bombers. John Lefort lived with his mother at the Blanc Pierre on the western slope of Hill 309. The German soldiers had just come to tell them to leave, as the English were attacking. They were just 800 yards from the house when it was demolished by a bomb. The Coldstream Guards arrived at the slopes of Hill 309. A railway line had to be crossed, and there were other obstacles to overcome. By 1900 hours, two squadrons were on the summit. No enemy present. The bombing raid had convinced the survivors to flee. Tanks alone can't effectively hold terrain securely. The first elements of the Glasgow Highlanders arrived at 22.30. By 02.30 on the 31st, the last of the rifle companies had arrived and an anti-tank platoon was in place. While the Coldstream were advancing to their objective, the Scots Guards were heading for Hill 226. The Churchill was great at crossing hedges but that didn't mean that the crew were unscathed. The nose would rise up, then the tank would balance on the crest before crashing down the other side. Sometimes crews were knocked unconscious. S Squadron reached the summit at 14.30. The Argyles were now advancing rapidly by using fire and movement. By 15.30, the village Les Loges was secured. Companies B and D joined the tanks on a reverse slope position on Hill 226. Their anti-tank guns were still being manhandled towards Les Loges. The Wessex Division of the 30 Corps was supposed to be at Hill 361 in the Bois du Homme. They had been stopped in their tracks at the start and were still trying to circumvent Carhang. As 11th Division, 29th Brigade, with their assigned infantry started out at 7, they lost a whole platoon due to a short 5.5 inch shell. They were held up passing Sevent, where the 15th was still in combat, at saint jean des artilleries Germans put up a fight until tanks of B Squadron Hussars began to pour fire into the village and a pincer movement by infantry and tanks cleared them out. It was now night time, so they harboured for the night. The 159th Brigade on the right was made up of the Hereford Regiment and the Shermans of the Fife and Forfars. After slow early advance up to Le Boisselier, the tanks were then told to baff. That means go as fast as possible. A fast moving tank is hard to hit. Seal Brownlee was leading the troop. In Operation Goodwood, when the tank ran out of ammunition, 
he replenished it from a knocked out tank. Later, his machine gun was worn out, so he got another one in the same way. His tank was hit and a piece of molten metal jammed the turret. He careered on, firing at Germans who were trying to get out of the way. Round the bend they encountered a Nebelwerfer. The gun had fired without being told. The trench was seen 100 yards away. Without being able to traverse, he had to turn the tank keeping out of Panzerfaust range and hit it with high explosive. The remaining Germans surrendered. They stopped for the night near La Morichaise. The Scots guards and Argyles had arranged their defences, expecting an attack to come from the Bois du Homme in the south. Everything was calm. The guardsmen were sat outside their tanks and an O-group meeting was being held. Suddenly, a Churchill tank was hit twice. The attack was coming from the northeast by three Jagd Panthers. 45-tonne monsters with the same gun as a Tiger, but less weight as it had no turret. Lieutenant Schreiber had dismounted and spent 20 minutes reconnoitring. Returning to the others, he reported eight British tanks. The three Jag Panthers roared towards the guards, keeping their thick frontal armour towards the Churchills, moving and firing, hitting the Churchill in the heavy shot. As he left to the southwest, the commander gave a disdainful salute. One of the men present on the hill was Captain William Whitelaw. He became Home Secretary in Thatcher's government. General Straub had pointed out that Hill 309 was vital to the defence of the area. He had his HQ at Le Bessie. The bombing raid forced him to move eight kilometres to the east to La Fourzillière. He was out of communication during their move. So he didn't know yet that the Hill 309 and 226 had been taken. Eberbach was aware of the crisis on their left flank and decided to send in the 21st Panzers. By midnight on the 30th, the 15th Scottish Division had staked their claim to both Hill 226 south of Carhain and Hill 309 above St Martin de Bezas. 11th Armoured had advanced two thirds of the way from Comont to Saint Martin. In the morning of the 31st, Saint Martin de Bezas was still in German hands. Any scout car coming too close was fired on. The most useful road for the 11th advance was the road south to Le Tourneur, but it was held firmly by the Germans. C Squadron of the Household Cavalry Reconnaissance was with the 159th Brigade of the 11th Armoured. With the 11th Division ready to break into St Martin, groups of scout cars and armoured cars set out to reconnoitre. Lieutenant Dickie Powley's group had two Daimler scout cars and two Daimler armoured cars. The third vehicle, which was an armoured car, got wedged in a sunken lane, so Lieutenant Powley carried on with his armoured car and Corporal Bland's Dingo scout car. They dashed through a German gun battery with the Germans firing widely. Powley said they might as well go forward. It couldn't be worse than trying to go back. They crossed the N175 out of sight of St Martin and took a road going southeast, then turned towards the Effect Forest. They saw a German armoured car going the same way in front of them and caught up with it. Any Germans they passed thought the vehicles were together. When the German vehicle turned down a lane, they carried on through the forest and passed through La Ferrière Arang. They turned left, then two miles further, they saw this bridge over the Souleuvre. Looking at the map, he realised just how far they'd come. They stopped, not knowing if it was guarded, Corporal Bland crossed over, covered by Powley's armoured car. It wasn't guarded, so Powley crossed over. They were six miles from HQ and the radio couldn't make contact. They finally managed to get it to work. 
HQ found it difficult to believe where they were. They took the vehicles off the road and camouflaged them. They saw German vehicles crossing the bridge several times. Tanks coming to meet them had various problems, but by 1400 hours there was a large force at the bridge. One problem was meeting American troops on this far right flank. General Jero of the 5th Corps risked getting squeezed out between the 19th Corps and the British 8th Corps. He told his troops to push forward, ignoring small pockets of resistance. Pauli had benefited from the lack of communication of the Germans. The Evec Forest wasn't only the boundary between Straub's division and Mindel's paratroopers, it was the boundary between the 7th Army and Panzer Group West. Nobody felt responsible for it. Several prisoners were taken as they attempted to use the bridge. One had a code book on him. The bridge became known as Bull Bridge or Dickies Bridge, the bull being the emblem of the 11th Armoured. In the evening of the 30th, Corporal Fulton of the 8th Rifle Brigade approaches St Martin. He sees a tank and throws a grenade at it. The tank disappears into town. At 8am on the 31st, three scout cars dash into town. The second is hit and starts burning. The third speeds up to catch the head car. Companies F and G of the 8th Rifles follow in with their attack. During the combat, Captain Straker stops to shout at the man to put his helmet back on. It was a German who fires at him and Straker was wounded. Company G enters the town to complete the search of the buildings. By 1700 hours, the town is clear. The British can continue towards the Benny Brockage. From Dickey's Bridge, Sergeant Sears C Squadron, three troop of the Hussars, advanced towards Benny Bocage. They were fired on by Mark IV. The gunner fired back and hit the Mark IV. The Mark IV reversed into town before being abandoned and set on fire. This was the first time the men had seen a town with people living in it. When Sergeant Sears was recognised as having destroyed the Mark IV, he was mobbed by the people. The three Royal Tank Regiment and the King Shropshire Light Infantry went over the hill to the north, crossed the bridge over the Soulève and cleared the way to Catiol, where the Mayor presented a German prisoner. The guards were supposed to be arriving from the Tourner some three RTR tanks went towards the Tourner and met stiff opposition, losing two tanks. They came back to Catiol. The Tourner was taken during the night by the Irish guards coming from Saint Martin. On the 31st, the main thrust of the 21st Panzers would be against the 8th Corps, especially Hill 309. If Hill 309 was retaken, St Martin de Bezas would be threatened and that vital road junction interdicted. At 5.30, the quiet night ended abruptly with a half-hour artillery barrage and infiltrating enemy. The German tactics were not to advance in line abreast, but in groups, seek out dead ground to occupy, then, under cover of tanks, advanced to more dead ground. The Coldstream tanks, higher up, would give support. Tension and the fatigue grew during the morning. Sometimes they'd fire at a tiger, which was in fact a hut. If the pressure mounted too much, the five and a half inch guns would pound the enemy positions. At 1600 hours, the main assault started, with tanks added onto the infantry. All the tanks at Von Appen could muster, including Tigers. Two Churchills were lost. Their newly acquired Sabbat ammunition just bounced off the Tigers. 
It was the medium artillery, plus three inch mortars, that kept them away. One thing that helped the Churchills was that they are more adept at moving over difficult terrain than tigers. Prisoners were taken amongst the Germans and many were now surrendering. Out of St Martin came the 9th Cameronians and the 15th Reconnaissance Regiment. From La Ferrière du Doyen in the northeast, the King's own Scottish borderers now launched a pincer attack towards the Bois Duham. Prisoners informed them that a further attack was being planned. The artillery saturated the Bois du Homme and typhoons swept across the ridge. This all fell on an entire battalion forming up for the attack. During this time, 30 Corps was advancing and the Tourner had been taken with its bridge intact. Von Klug realises that they need more reinforcements. He decides to send in the 10th SS Panzers. He also added on some Tigers. Dempsey was dismayed with the failure of 30 Corps to attain their objectives. He decided that the 8th Corps would assume the main thrust. After having taken the Bull Bridge on the Souleuve on the 31st, the 11th had to wait for the guards to move up on their left flank. Now that the guards had taken Le Tourneur, Pitt Roberts was free to unleash his tanks. He was told that the Veer was now in American sector. They were to head southeast into the Germans' rear. This complicated their task as they had to cross roads which led directly to Veer. These became phase lines named Coventry, Warwick and Rugby. Tanks can cross fields but they need to be supplied with fuel and that comes in tankers that need good roads. On the left the 23rd Hussars and the 8th Rifle Brigade, who were at Beni Bocage, would follow the line Le Désert, Prel, Chenandoli. On their right, the 2nd Fife and 4th R, with the 3rd Monmouth, would find a way from Le Reculé to Bercy Ridge and the Perrier Ridge. The Hussars met some German reconnaissance half-tracks before they reached Le Désert. These were knocked out. At junctions they would come up to a group around an artillery piece. As the infantry dismounted and spread out to surround them, the Germans disappeared to the next crossroads. At Prell, the regimental CP was set up. The FO started firing at tanks to their right. Major Blacker quickly dismounted to inform the observer that they were the Fife and Fourfars. The FO was about to call down artillery on them. When they arrived at a village, if there were flags up and people in the streets, there would be no Germans. If the streets were empty and curtains drawn, they would expect trouble. At Shenandoah, that didn't apply. Plenty of people around, but suddenly a shell hit a tank. No one was wounded but now the village had to be searched. Cromwell's of the 2nd North Ant Yeomanry, lacking infantry, took on a scouting mission. They went through La Bistiere, then Ituvi. Locals told them that Veer was empty, and so they approached. Some anti-aircraft guns fired at them, so it wasn't empty. Lieutenant Steele Brownlee set out from Benny Bocage, like the Hussars, they met some German half-tracks. They weren't fast enough to outrun the five Stuart recce tanks. After crossing Coventry, the pace quickened. They would often see sheets of white paper on the ground. The locals had marked mines that the Germans had just placed that morning. Their supporting artillery was the Ayrshire Yeomanry. They had three groups of eight guns. They would leapfrog each other, so that any time there were eight guns ready to support the tanks. On the ridge, the other side of Bercy, they saw some smoke. Artillery was called to fire on it. After a few rounds, a giant explosion was seen in the woods, 
As they descended and went through Bercy, the bells were ringing. Leaving Bercy, they changed course to avoid the German dump that they just fired at by going through Pavé. Elaine then arrived at the Shenandoli Road. They carried on down the narrow track towards Rugby, the Via Vassy Road. Steel Brownlee stopped his tank before reaching the road. He put on his German helmet and took his German rifle before walking up to the road. He was relieved that it was clear. To the right he could see to the top of the rise about 500 yards away and to the left as far as Léo Vent. He called up his tank and got it to park in the track the other side of the road. Then his corporal brought up his tank and parked facing west by the track. A lone German motorcycle appeared from the rear direction. He slowed down to wave at what he took to be a German officer and got shot by Brownlee and the corporal. They gave the German some morphine and laid him in the ditch. Shortly, a group of ambulances came from the Vassy direction. They are emptied and their occupants put in the ditch with the motorcyclist. The remainder of A Squadron plus C Squadron arrived to set up a defence perimeter. Some German tanks could be seen crossing the road at Léo Vent. Some fired and a Sherman brewed up. They were too far away for the Sherman's guns. Brownlee called on fighter bombers. Soon typhoons were on the way. As they approached, artillery laid down some coloured smoke at the Auvent. Salvos of 60 pound rockets cleared the road. Shortly, some thunderbolts turned up and strafed the British. During the night, you could hear some German tanks moving to the south. The 3rd Royal Tank Regiment and the King Shropshire Light Infantry left Catiol before the guards had arrived. They passed by the Ferronier to head for the road Warwick near Prell. At nightfall they felt their position was not secure and decided to move to Le Grand Bonfay. The infantry and tanks moved separately. Near Le Bonfay, the Shropshire's spotted three panthers. Company Sergeant Major Harrison decided to stalk them. He took a piat and got within firing distance. The bomb hit the sloping front and bounced off with a bang. The tank reversed a few yards and the crew got out, looking round in the gloom. Harrison advanced again, then the piat caught on a bramble and the bomb fell on the ground. This made him mad. He stomped down the lane a few yards, pushed the brambles out of the way and fired. The panther erupted and the crew disappeared. The Welsh guards, who had gone through Le Tourneur, arrived at Catiol around dawn. The 3rd RTR and the KSLI had already left. The road to La Ferronniere went through a gulch that became known as Malta Gulch. The Germans covered it from the hills on each side. Running the gauntlet of Morta Gulch caused some casualties. Approaching St Charles, Stug 3s were already in town. After losing a tank, they went around the town. The same thing happened at Montchamp. They now turned off across country. Late in the day, they had reached the phase line, road, Warwick. By evening they leaguered at La Marvindière. Friendly tanks were just half a mile away at Les Grands Bonfets. The Coldstream, Irish and Grenadier Guards were following behind the Welsh Guards and all ended up at La Marvindière. By the end of the 2nd August, Pip Roberts had set up his HQ at Le Reculi. The 11th had advanced well and needed to consolidate. Out of 145 Shermans at the beginning of the day, 31 had been lost, including six vital fireflies. He was concerned about the possibility of German infiltration behind them to cut off the vital supply transports. They did have the cover of the 8th Corps artillery. 
General Meindl had been authorised to pull back to protect his flank. Tanks of the US 5th Armoured had been seen at St Martin Don. Von Klug had problems. The Americans had broken through Avranches and from there they could move in any direction. To stem this advance, Hitler wanted him to mount a massive armoured counterattack towards Avranches through Mortain. That would be Operation Lutish. In view of the failure of the 30 Corps and the 7th Armoured to advance, both General Bucknell and General Erskine were replaced. The guards had been in contact with the forward elements of the 9th SS. They'd been rushed in to counter this unexpected advance. Their plan was to operate a pincer movement. Kampfgruppe Meyer would pass from Estrie through St Charles de Percy, then Le Beni Bocage. Kampfgruppe Weiss would follow the Vassy Veer Road, then strike northwards to Le Beni Bocage, meeting up with Kampfgruppe Meyer. In the morning of the 3rd, Steele Brownlee's troop went back to Regimental HQ to enjoy some rest and breakfast. They just finished breakfast when a call came from the Veer Road. Jimmy Sampson's troop had been attacked. Steele Brownlee headed back to find the troop leader's tank knocked out and no infantry to be found. The SS Panzer Pioneer Battalion 9 had been charged with opening the Vassy to Veer Road. They were now pushing north towards Bercy. They pushed the British back to the slopes of the Allier, where there was fierce fighting with Sherman's being knocked out by Panzerfaust. The 25 pounders of the airship Yeomanry finally stopped the progression. Bercy was now in no man's land and the Vassy Veer road was open to German vehicles. Weiss now had his group of Tigers in Veer. He had orders to establish a force at La Bistiere on the northern approach to Via. Nine Tigers moved out and two actually got within half a mile of Pitt Roberts HQ. One Tiger was immobilised after being hit many times and one strike knocking off the track. The Mayor's camp group now planned to advance in two groups, one from Montchamp to La Bistiere the other through Le Grand Bonfait to La Bistiere. This group came up against the Royal Tank Regiment Shropshire outpost at Grand Bonfait. Major Thornburn had set up an ideal defence position. They had the artillery nearby with predefined targets. Captain Garrett was their FO in a Sherman in the outpost. Thornburn set the platoons in positions with good visibility, but away from buildings and hedges. Buildings could be hit and collapse. Hedges could cause shells to air burst. Two anti-tank guns were set up between the platoons, but not too near. The gunners didn't like infantry milling around to give away their position. The only weak part was the tanks. They were grouped together in the centre, but too close to each other. Some movement was noticed near Le Bosque and tanks could be heard in the distance. A few shells were sent that way and a few came back. Then all hell let loose. The air was filled with shells and mortars. The men pressed themselves into their trenches. The tankers were caught outside their tanks and took shelter under them rather than inside. Then silence fell except for the sound of fires and men moaning for stretcher bearers. Suddenly, a dozen panzers appeared with infantry darting from cover to cover. The forward observer's radio was out, as were many of the tank's radios. Major Thornburn got on his radio to call for artillery support. He was offered typhoons, but they needed 400 yards margin of safety, and the Germans were just under 50 yards away. Artillery shells rained down on the target. Some tank commanders said they should pull out. Major Thornburn was the commanding officer. He said the infantry couldn't pull out from these close combat positions. Titch Hayward remarked 
He had a pound in his sights. He just needs to come a few yards closer. Sergeant Buck Kite had got his crew back into the tank. He stopped the first two panzers. He fired so many shots they ran out of armour-piercing shells. He carried on with high-explosive shells. Didn't do much against tanks, but that was better than nothing. He realised that the Firefly wasn't firing. With his gunner, they ran to the Firefly and conscripted a loader. Kite was stood behind the turret calling targets to the gunner. When the Firefly was hit, they went back to their tank, firing A2 shells. The knocked out tanks did add a stock of armour piercing shells, so a human chain was formed to bring shells to the active Sherman. Kite saw a panther traversing to aim at them. This is it, he thought, but the panther was using HE as well. Kite was knocked unconscious, but the tank and the crew were unharmed. The nearest friendly tanks were the Irish guards at the Marvindier, only a matter of yards away. At dawn, fuel supplies and rations came in for the Irish guards. None for the Coldstream infantry. The tankers had three days' rations in their tanks, so they shared with the Coldstream men. Brigadier Gatwin turned up and said they were to advance to Estuary, then Vassy, to hold the main road. It would be plain sailing. Two squadrons set out to lead the way. They just reported the way was clear when the lead tank brewed up. The infantry dug in and the advance ground to a halt. The forward infantry, three company, couldn't be seen by the 11th Armoured or the Shropshires at Les Grand Bonfets, but they stopped the 11th Armoured being outflanked. This time it was the Leicester Yeomanry whose guns kept back the Germans, but they in turn risked being overrun until the timely arrival of M10 tank destroyers. The fourth marked the end of Operation Bluecoat. Mont Panson hadn't been captured. That would be another video. The positions along the Vassy Road didn't change for some time, but troops changed positions. The Norfolks at La Bistiere moved to back up the Monmouth at Pave. On the 6th they had been attacked by infantry and armour sweeping up the eastern flank. B Company was about to be overrun. Corporal Sidney Bates seized an abandoned Bren gun. He urged his section forward to do a better vantage point. Firing the gun from the hip, he cut down the leading grenadiers, causing those behind to pause. Still the enemy came on, threatening to drive a wedge into the British line. Firing from the hip, Bates moved forward alone, hit by a machine gun, he recovered his weapon and continued firing into the enemy. Hit a second time and more seriously wounded, he got to his feet again, still firing. A third wound from a mortar bomb made him fall, but he continued to fire until he could no more. The enemy advance had melted away before this seemingly superhuman warrior. The position was held. Sidney Bates died two days later and was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. His action had held up the enemy attack long enough for a counter-attack to be mounted. He's the only Victoria Cross winner in the Bayer Cemetery.